Good morning. I'm Dr. Jim Epstein, and this is Best of the Day from the 55th Annual Meeting of the American Society of Hematology. It's Tuesday morning. The, the meeting is ending up, but there's a lot of interesting data to talk about. So this morning, we're meeting with Dr. Jorge Cortez from MD Anderson's Department of Leukemia. We're going to talk about some of the interesting data that was presented this year regarding chronic myeloid leukemia. So Jorge, welcome once again to Best of the Day. Thank you, my pleasure, thanks for having <laughs> so me. So there, were, there weren't a lot of new dramatic breakthroughs in CML this year, but a lot of um, important updates in clinical trials that we've been watching for several years, some um, additional new trials presented, and some uh, follow-up and updates on panatinib and, and other uh, agents. So let's begin with some of the, uh, the clinical trial updates. Um, the ENEST-ND data was updated this year, and I guess it was maybe four or five years ago that we first heard about this randomization of right. imatinib versus two schedules for nilotinib in newly diagnosed CML period. How is that data holding up over the years, and are there any new um, adverse events that have developed in long-term follow-up? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, the, uh, the NSTND <coughs> was uh, first presented actually here in New Orleans, and, uh, and uh, what we heard uh, this year was a five-year follow-up uh, of that study. And, and these, uh, although it's just a follow-up, I think they're very important because um, both in terms of the response and durability and all these things, and also, as you mentioned, in terms of uh, adverse events that may be occurring, uh, it is very important. What we, um, what we heard this, uh, this year is, is very reassuring. Um, the, the primary endpoints, of course, were, were met and that we, we learned very early. Uh, but now what, we're, what the focus has been is, number one, in terms of the molecular responses. And we know that the rate of major molecular responses and also of the deeper molecular responses, the, uh, what's what we call MR4.5, some people call it uh, complete molecular responses. So, so these deepest uh, responses uh, has uh, continued to be superior with nilotinib than with imatinib. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any suggestion that the curves are coming uh, together uh, with, a, with a longer follow-up. So it does look like there is a good separation of the two curves that is uh, maintained um, uh, over time. Uh, there's a good, uh, a, a good uh, 15, 20 percentage point difference in the, in the rate of, uh, of these deeper responses. Um, of course, these deeper responses um, are relevant when we talk about uh, treatment discontinuation, so, so that's not addressed in an SMD, but that's the relevance of those deeper right. responses. Uh, the rate of transformation uh, continues to be um, significantly lower with, uh, with uh, nilotinib, and usually by four or five years, you see very few transformations occurring, which is what we heard. Now, in terms of safety, nothing new in terms of, uh, of uh, adverse events occurring late. Um, I guess one of the big uh, areas where we're uh, focusing on now uh, is the cardiovascular events. We know that they occur with, uh, they occur probably with all the TKIs, but with, with the nilotinib more than with imatinib. Um, so there were some uh, ischemic heart events, some uh, cerebrovascular events, some peripheral arterial uh, occlusive disease uh, in some patients, uh, which numerically were uh, more frequent than, uh, than with imatinib. Uh, the rate is not excessive. Um, I, I calculated the, the, the rate to be somewhere around 6 or 7 percent based on the numbers that were presented, uh, which is a little higher than with imatinib. Um, but uh, but uh, that hasn't affected the mortality, by the way. The, the survival rate is, is equivalent for the two arms and the event-free survival equivalent. So it's still looking very good. Um, and mostly the, the benefits are earlier responses, deeper responses, and more responses. Um, uh, again, it hasn't translated yet into an event-free survival, but th that probably is going to take a little bit longer if, if it is going to do that. And I predict it will, but, but it's just going to take a little bit longer. Sure. Couple questions regarding the um, the cardiovascular events. Mm -hmm. Are there any clinical or biological factors that would tend to predict for that occurring? And then, is there a, a preference um, in your mind between the 300 milligram BID versus the 400 milligram BID? Yeah, these are these are great things that we're starting to focus on now. In terms of predictive factors, factors, uh, the patients who had these events for the most part, were patients with risk factors. 
hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, history of smoking, etc. So we know that those patients need special attention and uh, we need to focus on controlling their blood pressure and controlling their cholesterol, etc. Um, and uh, perhaps you know, this study didn't mandate that, but, 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 and we probably haven't been as aggressive on that. Um, evidently, we need to pay a, a, you know, closer attention to, to managing those uh, events. I don't think that represents a contraindication to use these drugs, mm -hmm. um, but it certainly needs a, a close attention. Um, now, uh, in, in, in terms of the mechanism, um, we don't know what, what's causing this, um, and, but, but evidently that's become a lot more uh, important and, and we need to work on, on trying to find out what's causing it, mm -hmm. how, how is it that these drugs are causing these, you know, some more than others, but, but, but in general we're seeing these events because that's going to let us to, to, to be able to address it better. Uh, but for the moment, at least clinically, pay attention to these uh, to these changes. Is there a dose relationship? There is. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of a dose relationship um, uh, in, in the NSD. As as you mentioned, there was the 400 twice a day and the 300 twice a day, um, and uh, and again, the data was presented just numerically, not percentage wise. So you had to do a little bit of math there. Um, but it do, it did appear to me that there was less with the 300 than with the 400 twice a day. 300 twice twice a day is the standard, so that's, that's a good thing because uh, obviously you would expect less with that dose. Well, the other ENEST trial was the ENEST-CMR trial in which mm -hmm. patients who had been on imatinib for at least two years uh, and had achieved, I think, at least a complete cytogenetic response but still had molecular evidence of persistent disease were then randomized either to continue imatinib or switch to nilotinib. That, that was also followed up this year. And how is that trial proceeding? So that's an interesting concept. Again, the focus here is can we get to these deepest molecular responses? Um, again, with intention being you, you, the, the, these responses could have two potential benefits. One is if you have a deeper molecular response, are you going to live longer or have a lower probability of relapse? And that hasn't been conclusively demonstrated, although there's starting to emerge some data to suggest that um, it doesn't correlate with survival, but, but it does correlate some with the probability of maintaining your response in the long term. Uh, and the second one is, if you're going to think about the treatment discontinuation, only those patients will be eligible for uh, this response. So in this study, what they do is these patients that are doing well with imatinib, a complete cytogenic response, as you mentioned, they're randomized to either continue imatinib or switch to nilotinib to, to try to seek these deeper responses. And what the study shows is that, uh, indeed, of course, some patients just with continuation of imatinib do achieve that response with, uh, with longer duration of treatment, but it is significantly higher, the rate, uh, for the patients who switch to, uh, to nilotinib. Um, and uh, they focused on these sustained, com the sustained, the primary endpoint is just complete, uh, excuse me, complete molecular response molecular in 12 response, months. Right. Um, but more important is these sustained complete molecular responses, again, because of the possibility of treatment discontinuation, and, and it is significantly higher with the, uh, with the switch to nilotin. Now, they also did show that the treatment discontinuation and discontinuation for adverse events was somewhat higher for patients with nilotinib. And, um, you know, evidently nilotinib is not more toxic than imatinib. It's at least equivalent, or in some patients it's actually better tolerated. But sometimes the change from one TKI to the other brings new adverse events to a patient who's right. otherwise doing well. Right. They notice now a new rash or something, and they don't like it. They, they kind of got used to their old right. way of feeling. Um, so that obviously needs a lot of discussion with the patient and, 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 uh, and addressing these, uh, these issues. But I think uh, we are going to be seeing in the, in the, in the future uh, many interventions. This is probably the first attempt at, at how do we improve these molecular responses, get them to the deepest possible molecular response, and, and eventually um, see if that uh, can result in, in, in cure. And, and the fact that this study shows that it is doable and it is possible with at least this intervention, uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good start. Good. Well, one, of the, one of the criteria <laughs> for switching for patients who are already on imatinib and possibly for patients who start on second generation has been this definition of early molecular response at, at three months where the, the PCR is below 10%. Uh, 
And um, the, the Spirit 2 trial, Stephen O'Brien talked about this, and they looked at those patients who had a number of dose interruptions or delays, missing days because of cytopenias or whatever, during those first, first three months, and now how that affected EMR and, uh, and the outcome of the patients. Tell, tell us about what they were trying to show and uh, what you think of that information. Yeah, I, I, I think that was a very, very valuable study um, because, as you mentioned, we, we've recognized, and that actually it's, it's been known for a number of years, it's become a little bit more uh, prominent in, the, in recent years, uh, the fact that at three months, the patients that have the best responses are going to have the best long-term uh, outcome. And we've come to, to these 10% by uh, PCR, provided it's by the international scale, which is grossly equivalent to a major cytogenetic response. Right. So if you have that, then you're going to have a much better probability of progression-free survival, um, even overall survival. So the question is then for those patients who haven't achieved that goal, what to do? And there's been a lot of debate, do you change therapy or do you not? Um, I, I haven't been changing my patients and, and one of my uh, reasons has been that this, this is a one-time point. And, and the second reason is, does it matter how you get there? Um, is it the same if you get there, if you've been taking your drug at the standard dose every day without any treat interruptions, uh, or if you are there because you've had treatment interruptions, you've had to dose reduce, et cetera, and, and you know, what's the consequence of that? And that's precisely what this study addressed. They, they looked at the patients who, um, who've been on this study and what had, what had been their dose intensity and their treatment interruptions during those first three months. Uh, you know, no surprise, but, but this is the first time that we've seen it objectively. Uh, those patients that have had more treatment interruptions, those patients who have had a lower dose intensity are more likely to be in that group that has higher transcript levels, um, which, which is associated with the board's long-term outcome. So, so that is very important information because obviously what we need to do is first address the reason for those treatment interruptions. Is it adherence? Well, then we need to work with adherence with our patients. Is it adverse events? Well, we need to manage those adverse events. In some instances, the appropriate intervention may be changed because of this toxicity, uh, regardless of the, uh, of the, of the transcripts. Um, so this is, I think, very, very important because it tells us that, well, number one, the dose intensity in the first three, year, three months is very critical, and we should try to uh, minimize interruptions or, or dose reductions that are not strictly necessary. Uh, and two, when that has happened because of valid reasons, um, that we pay attention to what's, what's going to happen with these patients in terms of their response so that we don't compromise in the efficacy in the long term. I got the impression from, from the abstract that dose reductions and dose delays were more common in the desatinib arm versus the imatinib arm. But the interruptions in the imatinib arm had a more worrisome outcome that the, the, the intensity of the desatinib could overcome dose delays and reductions as opposed to uh, those in, on imatinib. Yeah, you're, you're correct. I, they did make that point. And, and I think that what's, what's, uh, what we're seeing is that with desatinib, because of the potency of the drug, uh, you have more room to, to work on the uh, dose intensity. So there was not so much of a drop-off from going from 100% dose intensity to a 90% dose intensity. It looks like you're still at a, at a reasonable dose level for, for getting a good response. Um, whereas with imatinib, especially with 400, you're pretty much at the, at the limit of the, of the valuable or the right. optimal and those intensity. So once you start dropping off a little bit, you start yeah. losing that potency. Losing so right. uh, absolutely, it may not be, obviously dose intensity is relevant for all of them, but where you start breaking into, into worrisome areas may be different for different, uh, different drugs. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the German CLL4 study, our CML4 study. <laughs> the, the Germans have all kinds of CLL right. studies, but this is a German <laughs> CML4 study they took a look at their elderly patients 
those who were randomized to the imatinib 400 arm versus the imatinib 800 arm, and, and how the elderly patients did, how well they tolerated each dose, and, um, and whether it made a difference uh, in their outcome. So can you tell us about their data? Yeah, this is very interesting because the, the Germans, uh, you know, the, on this study, which had several arms, but here in particular, they're focusing into these two arms. It's a randomized study, so that makes it very strong. Uh, they focus on the patients who took 400 milligrams uh, versus patients who took 800 milligrams. And, and the, the global study uh, confirmed what, what we had shown some, some years earlier, that you get deeper, earlier, uh, better responses, et cetera, and, and that you do get a better event-free survival, uh, uh, you know, all of that. And in this analysis, they focused, as you mentioned, in the, in the older patients. And the question they were answering is, does it make a difference uh, for these older patients, whether you've been treated with the standard dose versus the higher dose? And for many people, it's been the, the concern of whether older patients may not do as well with the higher doses and may, 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 it may not be a great uh, strategy. But what they've actually shown is that the, the rate of achievement of a uh, good response, major molecular response, deeper molecular responses, et cetera, uh, for the patients that are treated with the standard dose, there is a difference between the younger and the, and the older. But once you treat them with a higher dose, they do equally well. Right. Uh, obviously, when you're using higher doses, you know, we, we've had a lot of experience, you need to manage adverse events. It's right. a little bit more toxic, no question. And, and, and uh, you know, they, they did it also very uh, proactively manage adverse events and, and adjust the doses as needed, et cetera. Um, but they did show that these older patients uh, end up having a very good outcome, uh, as good as the younger patients when they're treated with, the, uh, with these uh, higher doses. Great, that, that's interesting. It didn't sound like the median dose for the imatinib 800 dose was that much higher, that they probably had to cut the doses quite a bit more, but it must have made been enough to make a difference. I think so, and, and again, probably goes to these three-month uh, early data. I think that, that you know, this initial response is very critical, and, uh, and even if you end up little by little having to adjust the doses and uh, mm -hmm. but perhaps that initial push where you you start with a high dose and then adjust as needed right. uh, already makes a big difference uh, so so yeah I think provides that's, the same intensity perhaps that a second generation might have that's yeah. that's a possibility absolutely well speaking of second generations there was also an update on the decision trial mm -hmm. and this was the imatinib 400 versus desatinib 100 milligrams that trial also is now out about four years or so, and how is that data holding up? Correct. This is this was a four-year update. That this is a, a, like a, about a year behind the the and D, and um, and uh, it, it again showed the uh, very similar res results as uh, as we discussed with the and D, meaning um, a, a, a higher rate of major molecular responses with a with a difference that continues to be maintained a uh, very clear difference in the rate of major molecular response uh, over time. Um, and the, the same in the deeper molecular responses, um, MR4, MR4.5, those differences remain. And, and if anything, some of the curves appear to still widen the difference uh, over time. Uh, so we are getting more of these molecular responses. Um, and. Um, the, uh, the rate of transformation to uh, accelerated and blast phase continues being lower with the satinib than with, uh, with imatinib. So all of these parameters um, are, are holding up uh, very nicely with now four years of follow-up. Um, there has been, uh, again, no significant difference in, in uh, uh, event-free survival, or in these studies called progression-free survival, uh, or in overall survival. Um, but uh, same comment about the fact that perhaps it, that's going to have to take more time. We also see faster responses at three months um, with the uh, with uh, the satinib. Um, you get only about 15% of patients or, or less who are above the 10% uh, mark, uh, the, the PCR. Whereas with uh, with imatinib, you get about a third of your patients who are above that uh, that uh, that point. So you get these deeper responses. Uh, which which are very valuable very early on. 
Well, you mentioned that, that your group at MD Anderson has had a lot of experience with all of these agents, and you all had a poster mm -hmm. this year that didn't make an oral presentation, yeah. but was still a very interesting retrospective uh, examination of, of the patients that you all had managed with CML who were treated with standard dose imatinib, the high dose imatinib, nilotinib, ardisatinib, and, and the outcome and the responses of those patients. So tell us about that analysis and what conclusions you made. Yeah, this, uh, this is uh, sort of like a, a, a summary overview of all our experience with TKIs where we treated patients with imatinib 400. Then in 2001, we started using imatinib 800. And then in 2005, we started using the satinib or nilotinib um, as, as frontline therapy. So we kind of just showed that experience. And, um, and, and the, the advantage of this, even though it, it, this was not randomized, uh, the, the advantage is, number one, it's all in, in one institution, so all patients are followed the same and measured the same, et cetera. And, um, and uh, number two, it provides controls that we don't have in the other studies. You have the satinib and elotinib together, and you have high dose imatinib, et cetera. And what we've shown is that uh, the, the uh, you know, what we've, known from these other randomized studies, the satinib and the lotinib give you uh, faster, deeper responses. What's interesting is that the imatinib 800 gives you also faster and deeper responses, and, and, and it looks pretty close to the, uh, to the newer agents. Um, we do see in these long follow-up, since we have been doing these now for eight years with the new agents, uh, we do see uh, 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 what appears to be a uh, an opening in the, the uh, event-free survival uh, differential and the transformation-free survival in favor of the new interventions, including uh, the higher doses of, uh, of imatinib. So um, uh, the, these, these uh, analyses uh, appears to, to show that, um, that we are going to see that the event-free survival also in the randomized studies uh, with longer follow-up. And, um, and also opens that, that, that uh, door for the higher doses of imatinib as, mm -hmm. as an alternative for some patients. Uh, as we discussed earlier, many patients end up having to adjust the doses. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have a little bit more toxicity, but with proper adjustments, uh, I think it is manageable. Very good. And then one final follow-up. Let's just talk briefly about the STEM-1 study. And mm -hmm. this was the French uh, study where they took patients who had been in a sustained CMR for at least two years and discontinued their imatinib. And initially it, it appeared that about 50, 60 percent of them relapsed and, and then got restarted on imatinib and the vast majority of them again went into a response. But 40 percent or so of them remained uh, in a CMR. Maybe their PCR bounced around a little mm -hmm. bit but they remained in a, in a PCR off of imatinib. So what, what have, they, have they brought forward now in follow-up? Well, they provided the follow-up, and it's a, it's a very important, again, this is one of those studies that even though we think it's just a follow-up, it's very, very important because uh, one of the problems that we have with treatment discontinuation, why um, even Francois Mahon, who's the author of these, emphasizes very clearly in each one of his presentations that it has to be in clinical trials because the follow-up um, has to be still considered as short and, and therefore the data preliminary. Um, so now with, with uh, an extra year of follow-up, uh, it looks like there were very few new relapses or, 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 or problems. So uh, it looks like still about 35% of the patients, so close to 38 or something like that, uh, still remain with, uh, with, uh, without treatment at least. So um, as, as, it, as, as was demonstrated, from the beginning of this trial, most of the relapses happen in the first six months, and mm -hmm. so that seems to be holding that only an occasional patient here and there will relapse. I think one of the areas which is still not very clear how to interpret is those patients that you mentioned that some remain completely negative and, and those are a little bit more reassuring, but those patients will bounce back between negative and positive, and you're seeing low levels, but positivity um, you know, is, is what's the right way to approach those right. patients? You know, are we are we okay just monitor, just watching those patients without treatment, um, or is that putting the patients at some risk, uh, uh, if not immediate, in, in the long term? Nothing has happened in those in those patients, that fortunately. Um, 
but that is that is uh, something that, and that's one of the reasons why these things have to be done on a clinical trial, so that um, we we learn these uh, in an organized uh, uh, organized way. Um, so, you know, in summary, the, the results still look uh, favorable for a for a subset of patients, um, and the ones who relapse. The great majority of them have responded again to reintroducing the, the drug. Very good. All right, Jorge, thank you so much. We're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back and talk about some of the newer agents and the newer trials. So we'll be back with you shortly.